going. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Preservation Connecticut Spring 2021 series talking about preservation. Our noontime chats about everything preservation. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut, and I'm delighted to be your host today to talk about one of our favorite topics, lighthouse preservation. Dr. Casey Jordan and Dr. Frank Labanca are our guests from Beacon Preservation. But first, a little background on us. Preservation Connecticut is the statewide private nonprofit historic preservation organization. We were founded in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Pre Preservation. We preserve, protect, and promote the building sites and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut's communities. For over four decades, we have successfully championed the protection of remarkable community assets all in the state by leveraging funding, advocating, forming partnerships, and promoting stewardship. Our office is on Whitney Avenue in Hamden, Connecticut, and listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Shown here, it's the Eli Whitney Boarding House, built in 1827 to house workers for Eli Whitney's Gun Factory, and it has served as Preservation Connecticut's headquarters since 1989. We have a staff of eight preservation prof professionals and an active board of 21 preservationists from around the state. Staff listed here are always available to assist with inquiries. Christopher Wiegren, Deputy, Deputy Director, manages Preservation Easement Program and is editor of our acclaimed bi-monthly newsletter and recently published a book, Connecticut Architecture, Stories of 100 Places. Renee Trubert is our Making Places and Preservation Services Manager. Contact Renee for information on redevelopment of historic industrial sites and tax credit applications. Jordan Sorensen, is our development and special project manager. She manages our communications and outreach to members through social media and email, receives and monitors demolition notices from municipalities, and pre prepares historic tax credit applications and nominations to state and national register of historic places. Kristen Hopewood, development assistant, manages all of the inquiries that come in through our website provides member services and arranges special events, and is the editor of our Historic Properties Exchange, a free listing of threatened properties. And finally, our team of circuit riders, Brad Scheid, Mike Farino, and Stacey Vero, provide immediate boots on the ground assistance to homeowners, developers, municipal leaders, nonprofit organizations, museums, historic district commissions, and more with an array of preservation needs, including community organizing, prioritizing maintenance and repairs, historic designations, and funding. But we're here today to hear from you. During the recent stay at home period, these weekly chats have offered a meaningful way for us to continue our mission. We've been able to connect with the public and hear what's on your mind. Please feel free to use the chat feature to ask questions, ask questions directly at the end of the presentation or contact us afterwards for a call or a site visit. Before I turn the program over, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Scholar Painting and Restoration for being longtime business members with Preservation Connecticut and for sponsoring today's program. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Casey Jordan and Dr. Frank Labanca, take over the screen. Hello, everyone. I'm Frank Labanca. I'm pleased to be with you today to share some stories of the Southwest Ledge Lighthouse um, acquired by Beacon Preservation a year or so ago. I love talking about lighthouses uh, specifically because, you know, they, they have this mystique and, and beautiful history to them. My uncle used to call them the vanishing castles of America. 
And, uh, and I always love that uh, reference to them. So it's wonderful to be involved with an organization that seeks to preserve and, and share them with the world. So this is uh, one of his paintings actually of the Southwest Ledge Light in the New Haven Harbor. I'm gonna share with you some background information, share some fun stories about this light and um, some of its history as well. You know, lighthouses often have the, uh, the mystique of hauntedness to them. This one doesn't share uh, too many ghost stories with it, although it does have some uh, very colorful characters that did live there. So in terms of quick facts about it, uh, it's located at the southwest edge of the New Haven Harbor East Breakwater. It is an offshore lighthouse. It's approximately one mile offshore. The height of the tower itself is 45 feet and its focal plane is 57 feet. Originally, it had a fourth order Fresnel lens. That's those fancy glass cut lens that were uh, originally developed in France. And currently it has an automated uh, RB25. It flashes red every five seconds and it has fog glass every 15 seconds. That is now an automated fog system. So uh, sailors or boaters could uh, trigger that from their um, radios. It's got the second empire architecture design and uh, that's characterized mainly by having a mansard roof. Um, the second empire design was uh, developed in the late 1800 in France. 1800 in France. Um, you, you'd probably see it more familiarly as a common design feature in Washington DC buildings, but um, the light itself has five floors or levels to it. And I'll take you on a brief timeline history of, of this light. So in 1872, the Congress uh, approved the construction of it and it was designed by Major George Eliot. And it was actually lit on New Year's Day in 1877. Its first keeper, and, and keepers, this is a, being a keeper was a tough job. You lived offshore, uh, you spent some time in maybe not so great quarters. And so the first keeper was Eliza Thompson and he was followed by the longest keeper uh, in the history of this light, which was his son, Henry Thompson, who served from 1881 to 1898. However, uh, um, Henry was discharged of his services at this light. And the reason he was discharged, as it was written in the documentation, was for intoxication and dereliction of duties. So uh, I think he got to, to the, the, the substances and, uh, kept himself busy by drinking a little too much and he was he was discharged from that. And he was followed by keeper Frank Hall and a keeper then Jorgen Tonneson. And I think uh, the story of Jorgen, Jorgen is kind of interesting in the sense of his, um, his assistant keeper. So he was, his assistant keeper's name was Niles Nelson and Niles was uh, actually a keeper at a lighthouse in Rhode Island and was kind of demoted. To, uh, to being the keeper at the Southwest Ledge Light. And most likely, although the history is not clear on this, he was, he was demoted due to some mental illness. And um, so at one point, actually at the Southwest Ledge Light, again, offshore, a mile offshore, he uh, became deranged and started chasing the keeper, uh, Jorgen, with an ax. And, uh, and so Jorgen climbed up uh, higher up the, the structure and barricaded himself in and Niles could not get at him so he jumped in a rowboat and rode, rowed offshore and uh, and left uh, the lighthouse. He did return uh, later but Jorgen was very concerned about his safety so he asked his brother-in-law to come hang out with him for a bit and in fact uh, Niles did again and here's a picture of Niles actually. Uh, Niles did, in fact, have another episode and held him uh, with a knife, and his brother-in-law was able to uh, get him off. Niles uh, left and uh, wound up committing suicide uh, at in New Haven on shore. But um, really, kind of a, a, a guy that was um, really troubled by the process. One of the things I didn't actually know until I started doing some work on this is that the Southwest Ledge light, as you can see in the picture, was actually an offshore light in the water. Now, if you were to go there, there's a, a very long, about half mile long breakwater that's attached to it. It's at the very end of the breakwater, but that light was initially just in the water. So that breakwater used to protect the New Haven Harbor uh, was built at a later time in 1915, toward the end of, uh, you know, right after uh, Thompson's keep there. 
followed by uh, John Peterson. And uh, John didn't last too long because there were just too many cockroaches on the Southwest Ledge Light. And he writes that he was very uh, bothered by the uh, squalor conditions at, at the Southwest, Southwest Ledge Light and uh, chose to move on. He did not like it. And there were several other keepers along the way. We've seen him already. One of the later keepers was John Astama. He has a sad story. He actually fell off the light. Uh, he was rushed back to uh, New Haven. Unfortunately, you know, uh, it was not quick. He, he did suffer, uh, he did die from his fall off the light. And uh, the final keeper that lived there permanently was Michael Scanlon. Basically, after he left, uh, the light was automated in 1953. So not really clear what happened between 43 and 53, but we uh, do know that there were uh, onshore keepers that would keep watch and, and just keep look to make sure the light was functioning properly after its automation. The modern optics were installed in the late 80s. So, uh, and then in 1990, the lighthouse was added to the National Register of Historic Places. In 2015, fast forward another 25 years, uh, it was listed, the lighthouse was listed in access by the, um, the GSA, Government Services Administration, and it was auctioned off as part of the National Historic Preservation of Lighthouses. In 2018, uh, Beacon, our organization, acquired it for historical, educational, and cultural preservation. Uh, its original lens was a fourth order Fresnel lens. So the first order are the really, really big ones, uh, all cut glass, handmade, uh, beautiful structures. Modern optics have really taken the place of this. And I think that's kind of the interesting story of lighthouses too. You know, you can get away with a lighthouse with a, with a, a flashing light on a stick now. So uh, the that could serve the function of a lighthouse. It does not uh, do well in serving the beauty of what a lighthouse is. and and what a unique structure is and, and why it's so deserving of preservation. This is what the current lens looks like now. It's got um, plastic polycarbonate, I believe, optics on it to really reflect the light outward. And it flashes, so not, it's not spinning anymore. It just does a flash, it does pop of light, and that's the signal for the lighthouse. Here are some of the original uh, schematics for the lighthouse. Uh, from 1875 as part of the documents that are in the National Archives at the Library of Congress. You can, uh, not, no, the National Archives, not the Library of Congress. The National Archives, you can actually uh, get these all online and see these do beautiful documents. Uh, you can see the design of the structure, especially with the, the very unique roof line that this light has. It has a very unique uh, feature. Here's one of the original perspective views or painting views of it in the middle of the water. I, I was curious about that. And I think, you know, I've always assumed that it had that giant breakwater that was in New Haven Harbor the whole time, but it was it was a freestanding in the water. Uh, again, some more of the design plans for the lighthouse. You can see some of the uh, fancy plating and, and designs that give it that classic Second Empire architecture structure. And I'm gonna share with you a short video that was recorded uh, by Dr. Uh, Breslin, who was a who is a professor at Southern Connecticut State University. I've edited it a little bit to make it a little bit shorter, so you don't have to ride on the boat as long, and uh, you can get some good views of what the lighthouse looks like. If you've never seen where this light is in New Haven Harbor, um, I, I will give you a Google Maps view and zoom in on it, so you can see that at the beginning of the video, and then you can get a, a good sense of what it looks like.
I want to thank you very much for listening to my uh, part of the story. And now I'd like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Casey Jordan. Okay, gang. So you should know that uh, Dr. Labaca took the, this time out of his busy day as a principal of a middle school to talk to all of you. So he's going to have to go like do lunch room duty or something in a minute. So if anybody has any questions for Frank right now before he clicks out, um, be sure to ask right now as I bring up my share of the program, which is going to be a little bit of history um, of what Beacon has done over the past 15 years to prepare ourselves for the challenge of doing Southwest Ledge Light, which we refer to just because it's a mouthful as SWELL. That's our acronym for it, S-W-E-L-L. -L. So if you hear us talk about SWELL, it's just that's the, the New Haven uh, lighthouse that we've been talking about. So at, unmute and ask any questions if you have them. Other than that, I'm going to open up my own presentation. Hello, uh, my name is Bruce Buckley. Hi, Bruce. I'm on the, I'm president of the London Ledge Light Foundation. So you do I, great work there. I welcome you all. So my question is just, uh, is, is the foundation of, of the of Southwest Light is that a metal structure that they uh, they sunk there and pumped out and filled with rip rock and then I'm just curious as to how they built that because it was it, the base uh, the foundation must go all the way down to the to the uh, floor of the sea and then they built uh, around that and then later put the rip rock in so is uh, how did they do that I'm curious you know so I'm not um, entirely. Uh, facile with the technology associated with it, but yet they built the case on and then began to sink it and pumped out. So, how okay, so that? it's a metal enclosure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's like the, the spark plugs, they used to call them. Yeah. The modular ones. There's, there's a couple of them around here. One at the mouth of the Connecticut River, and then there's one down at Latimer's, which is further down Fisher's Island Sound. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Bruce, you refer to the spark plugs, and the one I'm going to tell you about that we have in Maine is indeed called the spark plug. It's the spark plug design, um, and it, indeed it was modular, and all the iron plates were brought from, um, I have to remember the name of the manufacturer in Boston in the 1800s. But yeah, they would bring the case on in big plates and bolt them together and embed them into the ledge and then fill that with granite, right, and then start building up from there. So just kind of like a big metal circle donut that they would put, fill with riprap. And in fact, I'll start the presentation on Goose Rocks. And Frank, if I don't see you again, go have a good day at school. Um, what's, Goose Rocks. What, what's interesting is that originally, when the government announced at the mouth of the Thames River that they were going to put a lighthouse there, it was going to be a spark plug. Mm. In, in the town fathers wanted something there that represented the wealth and prosperity of New London and Groton and said, we want something that represents us in that light. And the government said, you're getting a spark plug. So, <laughs> so yeah, actually they raised the money. Harkness and Plant actually raised the money and, and it, was, it was built with private funds. Fascinating. I, uh, Go ahead. Can you guys, uh, I have a question. Uh, Penfield Reef is coming up for auction June 21st. Yeah. Are you guys going to be bidding on it? No, we owned Penfield back in 2008. And without getting into that long story about Penfield, we returned it. We got it from the grants process. And I'll explain the whole process to everybody during this presentation. Um, we've had it. And, um, and Penfield is actually in incredibly good shape now, way better than it was when we first saw it in 2007, because after Superstorm Sandy, there was all this federal emergency funds and the Coast Guard actually procured, I think like $800,000 of the Superstorm Sandy emergency fund and used it to do tremendously needed repairs on the roof. Um, after it was repaired, we had we gave it back for political reasons, not because we couldn't do the renovation, but because um, there was a lot of disagreement about the bottomlands and who controls them and who could lease them. Connecticut did not have in place at that time uh, any. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah. I think both Bridge, Bridgeport and Fairfield wanted to both tax it. 
Yes. So, and, and to, and, and our biggest issues, just to put it clearly, and I'm an attorney and we ended up filing a lawsuit with the feds and just finally decided this one wasn't worth it. Um, it is in BlackRock, which is Bridgeport. So our position was that Fairfield would have nothing to say about it. And our position further is that the bottom lands belong to the U.S. government, not the state. And I did a tremendous amount of legal research on this and hired experts on it. And that is still our position. Um, it got to the point where we did not believe that it was a good use of our time and resources to fight that in federal court. So we simply returned it to the feds. Um, they were busy putting it up for re-auction. I, I think that Fairfield believed that it would just be given to them after Beacon returned it to the feds, and that isn't at all how it works. They then put it up for private auction. They did not re-offer it to a municipality or a nonprofit as a grant. Um, they had given it to us for no money. We gave it back, and they said, well, the next phase, if there is no appropriate winner, is to put it on auction. And I believe it sold for like two hundred and sixty-five or $85,000 with $800,000 worth of repair bait from the Coast Guard. So we have closed the book it's, on it's Penfield. It's supposed to be coming up. It's coming up for auction June 21st. Uh, okay. I'm, to be honest, we don't follow Penfield anymore because basically my board did an intervention with me and said, Casey, <laughs> there are other lighthouses that need saving. And this one is just obsessing you. So um, we'll talk very briefly. I'll show you a little bit about what we did with Penfield, which was great precursor for our renovation of Goose Rock. Um, we were very fortunate and very blessed to get a grant in 2009 of $30,000 from 1772 Foundation to uh, outfit Penfield with uh, solar and wind. And that was the kickoff for our educational program, which Frank is the academic director of called Greenlight Academy. Um, at, at the end of this, you'll find out that all the grant money has dried up and Greenlight Academy has had to be parked indefinitely. But we started Greenlight Academy with Penfield Reflight and the kids went out and actually took the batteries out, installed a, a um, wind turbine, and we were fast on track of making it sustainable uh, when all of the kind of political stuff began to interfere. With Fairfield wanting us to get approval from their buildings department, pay taxes, a lot of dispute. They actually passed something in the Connecticut General Assembly, which said they owned the lighthouse and the, and the bottomlands. And we just ended up walking away because it was not, as I said, a good use of our time and effort to, you can't fight City Hall. And so we just decided to work on the things that we could save. And we, we believe Swell is that next chapter. We have no problems with New Haven at all. So um, back to the source though, let's talk about how we learned what we did. And that is gonna be with Goose Rock Light. And I love that Frank goes into a lot of the history. Can I just tell you, and I know you, I'm preaching to the converted. If you believe in historical preservation, you do your research on the history. You go to your local historical society, you talk to your local people, you gather as many photos and stories as you can. Um, Frank and I are both professors. So we are like archivists by nature in our blood. <clears throat> we love doing research and we love recording it. And this is some of the things that I found from um, in North Haven, Maine's Historical Preservation Society. And um, these are real pictures of real keepers. The bell that you see there is actually um, now, somehow, I don't know how it ended up there. It's in a park in Rockland, Maine, and I'm trying to work with Rockland to see if we can return it to the lighthouse. The le not the least of which uh, is just on display there. Um, but we we would love to get it. We're not at all sure how we would get it up there <laughs> at this point. It's like getting it's one thing. Getting it back onto the top level again would be an entirely different uh, challenge. And this is how the keepers originally got out there. They literally rode back and forth out to the lighthouse. I kind of like this snippet from a letter. Um, it says, in view of the fact that the above, this was from a keeper, that the above station provides quarters for the families of keepers. He's talking about Rockland Breakwater. And as I have no family also, I am being considered for Rockland Breakwater Light. I had rather not accept this position. And this was a nice bachelor keeper giving up his chance to go to a much nicer Victorian house on a breakwater. Um, the Rockland Breakwater uh, Lighthouse is really beautiful, but it's big and it, it allowed families of keepers to stay there with him. And Goose Rocks was considered a bachelor 
lighthouse <laughs> only for single men or men who did not require their, their families to live with them. Um, some of them had their families on the island of North Haven and were okay with that. So this was a nice thing that something, I think it was Mills wrote, in which he gave up his chance to go to the Rockland Breakwater and decided he would go to Goose Rocks to, to be nice to lighthouse keepers who had families. And it's just kind of a nice slice of life to see the kind of things that came out of the lighthouse service in the Department of Commerce you know, Mills um, was a longtime lighthouse keeper. His family still lives on the island of North Haven. I kind of enjoy the one to my right, which says, uh, Mr. Mills apparently wrote to the Department of Commerce Lighthouse Service. He was upset because when he departed Goose Rock, uh, the new lighthouse keeper who came in to make things easier said, I'll buy the furniture that you got out here one stick at a time in your rowboat. And he said, sure, sure, good. So they agreed on a price, but he didn't get his money from the new lighthouse keeper. And now he's calling on the lighthouse service to basically do mediation and get him his money, get that lighthouse keeper to send him his money for that furniture. And it's just kind of a lovely letter to say, I have, I have informed that this matter will be taken up with Mr. Pierce and you will be informed of the results obtained, the very formal way that they wrote a hundred years ago. So Goose Rock had many local keepers, meaning they were actually raised on the island of North Haven. And North Haven is a small fishing um, island off the coast of Rockland, Maine, part of the Fox Island thoroughfare. It has about 3,000 people year round and uh, they are lobstermen. There is really no industry other than fishing. And so it was considered almost a wonderful job if you were a lobsterman to be able to work at the lighthouse and you know to get that federal job. So uh, you can read all about this, of course, online. The beauty of, beauty of Google is you can get the history really fast. Um, Myrick Morrison, he was the principal keeper for 18 years from 1920 to 38. And I have interviewed his um, daughter who is now deceased, but she was in her eighties and she had wonderful stories of running around uh, there as a child. And um, he had his wife, Eva, he had a daughter and four sons. And uh, Greta took over the housekeeping duties in West Kent Cove. I mean, they were just entrenched in this local island life. And even today, um, there are, did I say there are 3,000 people? There are 350 people. There are 3,000 in the summer. So when you have all the summer people come to North Haven, you get 3,000 for three months of the year, really two months of the year. The rest of the summer, uh, the rest of the year, there are 350 local people who live on the island. It has the smallest K through 12 in the entire state of Maine as its school. And it um, went from about 58, I think they're down to like 45 students in their, in their K through 12 now. And they refuse to uh, export the kids off. They pay, there's like a one, a ratio of one student for one teacher for every two students there at this point, because the school is the biggest employer on the island, as you can imagine. So I've enjoyed talking to my Rick Morrison's relatives who still live on the island. This lighthouse was automated in 1963. And this is kind of a rare photo it definitely had a catwalk roof for a while, and it had apparently uh, been so damaged by storm that they took it down. And this picture was taken in um, probably the 60s or 70s, uh, when you could see that they had automated the light and put these kind of garish uh, solar panels up there. And for a little while after automation, they said there was a time when the local people from the island were called lamplighters. They were employed to control the fog signal at the lighthouse. And Samuel Beveridge, the Beveridge clan is very big on North Haven. Um, Calderwood and his wife and Elmer Carver, all of these families are still there. They served as lamplighters and they lived at Little Thoroughfare, not far from the light and they were aware of the fog conditions. And I can tell you that whenever our fog um, horn is discrepant, when it's going off when it's not foggy or it's not going off when it is foggy, you can be sure the locals absolutely call. They call me, they call the Coast Guard, they're like, what's going on? So there's this kind of new attitude. We don't need these lighthouses. You can get a little solar panel and a, as Frank said, a light bulb on a pole, embed it in the ocean and that'll guide your people. I can tell you that the local people will fight tooth and nail for their lighthouses. They insist that not only uh, are they beautiful castles of the sea, but that they definitely depend on them for, um, for navigational purposes. And I have definitely tried to kayak out there um, from 
parties on the island back out at midnight, even in still water. When that fog sets in, you need that horn. You can't see the light for anything. Now on the island of Vinylhaven, just south of this, they put in three huge wind turbines for electrical production for the islands. And they all have blinking red lights on top. And all of the people complain about this. First of all, I don't think they love the wind turbines. Um, they're very traditional. But they insist that the lights on the top of the wind turbines confuse them and screw up their boats because now they don't know what is the lighthouse and what is the wind turbines in the background. So, you know, something we never anticipated. So those of you who aren't familiar with how the NHLPA works, it was designed in 2000 and it was patterned after the very successful Maine Lighthouse Preservation Act, where Maine was disposing of its lighthouses by uh, bequeathing them through a process to the local municipalities or nonprofits, the Friends of Lighthouse organizations like Bruce is involved in. Thank you, Bruce. Um, and the feds looked at what Maine was doing and they were like, this could work for lighthouses across the entire United States. So the NHLPA Act of 2000 offers a two-phase system. For those of you who don't quite know how it works, you just know that they're for sale and they're getting rid of them and they're decommissioning them. It's really pretty simple. The General Services Administration, the GSA, which is kind of the real estate agency of the federal government, uh, puts determines they, they have a, a roster of all of the lighthouses and they decide which ones should be disposed of in what order. And a lot of that has to do with a bunch of variables, not the least of which is how bad are they? And not surprisingly, the ones that are in the worst condition, the ones that are the most derelict, are the ones that they're trying to put up first so that they don't actually demise further before going into the hands of somebody who will preserve it. So when they announce it on the GSA website, you've got two phases. And the first phase is offering it to a nonprofit or a government entity, which is the local municipality in which it exists or the federal government or a nonprofit, um, generally 501c3 corporation. They vet people very carefully to make sure that they're legit. And they generally don't love it if you just run out and start a nonprofit for the sole purpose of getting a lighthouse. They kind of see through that. You have to, I have done three of these proposals now and um, they give you three months to do it and you will need all three months to do it full time to get together the level of proposal they're looking for. When we got our first one for Penfield Reef Light, uh, I, with two interns, worked on it full time. It has a bunch of sections which have to do with your preservation plan, and it has to be like really articulated with a timeline, your resources, your um, board of directors and their expertise, your partnerships with local preservation people. They want a five year plan and they want all of the backup for what materials you currently have. How are you going to get the rest of the materials? How are you going to be able to afford to do this? And it is just like, you, you know, you kind of need an MBA or something like that to be able to do all the financials and everything else. I think ours was about 340 pages in total, including photographs, site plans, um, historical background on the lighthouse and everything else. Um, Fairfield did put in for Penfield as well. And I never saw their proposal, but I understand that it was about 35 pages. And I just don't think they understood what the federal government was looking for. So the GSA granted Penfield Reef Light to Beacon. Um, we already had Goose Rocks, which we'll talk about shortly. And it had no what they call callbacks. I've done other ones where they come back to you, they call them comebacks, and they go, we have your preservation plan, we have your grant proposal here, but we have the following questions. Once I had two questions and once I had like 24 questions and I just knew there was no overcoming it, right? But they usually give you, if you are writing the grant proposal to get the lighthouse for free, okay? They are going to give you an opportunity to, they want to do that. They want it, they want stewards. And the reason is because if you make a lighthouse plan, they are going to give it to you for free, but they're going to watchdog you on your five-year plan. You have to put in regular reports, make sure you're doing what you said you were going to do to get this free lighthouse. And if you don't, they can actually take it back, repossess it if you are not on plan. And that's good. That makes sure that it's going to be preserved. If it is sold, which takes us to phase two, that is where they do an invitation for bids, often called an auction. But can I tell you straight up, it's not really an auction because they don't have to sell it to the highest bidder. It's an invitation for bids. And when they get the bid that is the highest and best, and they believe it is the best that they can get, I do understand that a lighthouse, I'll look up what it was. I think the highest selling one has now sold. I said, 
The typical sale price usually is $200,000, $350,000. I think one of them just sold for $975,000, right? So it's um, kind of a, yeah, a sticky and sometimes controversial issue as to whether they should give them for free or sell them because you should know that once somebody buys it, they have no covenants other than you must preserve it, which at its most base level could mean doing absolutely nothing, just doing no harm, right? They would rather see them fixed and preserved than to have people buy them and just put them in their real estate portfolio and never fix them, never restore them, never pay attention to their history, never open them for public access. And of course, when you do the grant, you agree to preserve it for, and they have like four or five different um, categories you can choose, obviously historical preservation, recreation, educational, um, cultural purposes, right? And we always pitched doing it for both historical preservation and cultural, but mostly educational purposes because our plan has always been to let local students, high school students from at-risk communities or marginalized communities, um, and then we get grants to do this, help design the restoration plan and usually help install through our program called Greenlight Academy, um, the actual installation of their design of wind turbines and solar panels so that we can now have the energy to preserve the lighthouse. And I'll talk more about Greenlight. So you should know, I'm very, I'm, I'm very transparent. I, I don't like playing games. Um, the original process was done by sealed bid, uh, so-called auction, request for bids. And I procured um, Goose Rocks Light, I'm trying to think of the exact amount I paid. Uh, in 2006, I was the last closed sealed auction. So they had put it out for phase one. There had been, I think, one nonprofit application, but it was not to their standards. In other words, I think it was somebody who had just created a nonprofit. In fact, I know who it was. And he ended up getting a different lighthouse down the road after he had more experience. But he had created a nonprofit and he had put in an application for Goose Rock. And I think it was one of those kind of 35 pagers and they just dismissed it and put it out for auction. I went with my then husband um, almost as a goof. We were gonna go to Maine and I was like, let's go see a lighthouse, it's free. We just sign up for the inspection. I know we're not really gonna buy a lighthouse but it would be so much fun to get onto a lighthouse that no one has access to and they take you out in a boat and it would be a really romantic thing. And he's like, huh. And this is how naive we were. Sorry for all the storytelling. We drove there from Connecticut because um, the lovely, my favorite human at the GSA, Mita Cushing, who's in charge of um, NHLPA, LPA there, she um, sent me an email saying, uh, I see you've signed up for the lighthouse inspection. We have scheduled it for this day at this time. Can you attend? And I wrote back, I said, I'm so sorry. I can't attend that day. I'm just coming back from uh, a trip. So you can take us off the list. And she wrote back, she goes, what day could you attend? And I was like, okay, uh, you'll rearrange the inspection for us. She goes, we really would like you to attend. So she moved the date for us. And then I was like on the hook to actually show up. And it turned out not to be a great time and date at the last minute. And my husband was like, we're driving to Maine right now at six o'clock. We just got off work. I said, tomorrow morning, we're on a lighthouse inspection. We're going to Maine for the weekend. And we drove all night. I was having a devil of a time finding anything on this in this town called North Haven where we could spend the night. Um, and I ended up going, well, we'll just find something when we get there. We'll look for a Motel 6. I'm trying to explain how incredibly naive and off the cuff this was. We drove and got there at about 1130 and we pulled into this weird parking lot next to the ocean and our GPS turned from a, a green line into a dotted line and we realized that we were facing the ocean and the only way to get to North Haven was by ferry. We didn't even realize North Haven was an island when we put it into the GPS. That's how, how naive we were. That's okay. We found a place to stay in Rockland and we got on the ferry the next morning and met Mita and went out and saw this lighthouse. And when we, we looked at it, my husband had the engineering mind and I have the, um, you know, the grant writing and proposal and I'm the renovation design person. He's the hands-on guy. And um, we talked after we left there and we, I talked about, because I'm a social scientist by trade, I talked about how the few people who were there looking were not at all interested. They were just like us. They were looky-loos. One of them was the grandson of one of the lighthouse keepers who just wanted to see it one last time before it was sold and you know wanted to reminisce. It was touching. We talked to him. We're still in touch today. And the other one was like a couple... Um, who had this huge movie camera and they were just taking a lot of pictures and they were like gonna put it in a, in some kind of photo expose, but they weren't thinking good, good on it. 
And I said, you know what? I think that we, I think we should actually like put in a bid. Um, I think that no one else is going to bid. And the opening bid was $15,000. And that, in other words, that's what you had to start at. I did a little bit of research and I found out that the least expensive one had been sold for 32,000. And that was one that had been gutted by fire. That it was just an empty shell. This one's pretty much an empty shell as well. Um, I was unfortunate enough to total my car in the coming week. And I got an insurance check from, for my totaled Volkswagen and we bid the insurance check, okay? And in the end, they came back and they said, it's not quite enough. <laughs> and they said, can you come back with your best and highest? And I wrote them a very sweet, but lawyerly professorial letter saying, you have to understand, we are just a young couple who believe in this preservation. We are gonna, not only that, but if we break the tooth on a saw blade, we have to get in a kayak and kayak to the island and get on a ferry and go back and find a car or take a taxi to the Home Depot to replace a saw blade. It could take years out of our lives to do this. And um, they said, what's your best and highest? And I gave them the price, which was $26,000 that I had just gotten a check for my Volkswagen. And that is what we paid for this lighthouse. And you, I hope you're smiling because it's never going to happen again. <laughs> this was the last of the closed sealed bids. In other words, you sent it in on a piece of paper with a deposit check and they opened all the envelopes on a Tuesday at two and the highest got it. Okay. Now, as you know, they're all done eBay style and they're all put out to auction through social media and they're all selling for um, basically now it's not 200 to 350. It's more like 350 to a million is what they're selling for. So Goose Rocks. Uh, we got it in 2006, and it looked like this. Now, I know you're sitting here going, that looks really bad. By all accounts, and I've seen a lot of lighthouses, and I've been on a lot of lighthouse inspections, this one was in very good condition. It was level, and that's the biggest thing you look for is level and listing. And this is the keep, the lowest level of the lighthouse. And you see the two hatches on the floor, and those were cisterns um, in the pole in the middle had a wick that would go up, and this is just based on what we've read. One of the cisterns would have been for uh, oil to run the lamp in the 1800s, and the other cistern would have been for collecting rainwater so that they had rainwater to, um, to drink and bathe with because there was no other way of getting water out there. And the wick would have run from the oil co containing tank under the level. And at high tide, this is all underwater, okay? So if you may look at this and think it's really disgusting looking, we looked at it and we're like, yay, there's no water inside of it. Because I had seen so many um, lighthouses, including Saybrook uh, Breakwater, that had two or three feet of oil scummy water in the bottom. And that just is a whole huge problem that you're not sure you want to get into. So by and large, it is always dry. And that was the number one thing we looked for. Um, you know, we have this as an aid to navigation. You should know if you get one of these, whether you buy it or whether you uh, get it for free. Assuming it is still an active aid to navigation, and most of them are, they're automated and the U.S. Coast Guard is in charge of all of the battery systems. They're in charge of the foghorn if you have one and the lens. They change the light bulbs. They come and fill the batteries. This was the original battery pack. You'll be very happy to know we have had nothing but great things to say about the GSA and the Coast Guard. But the biggest thing we didn't love was these big solar panels that are out on the deck of the upper level of um, Goose Rock. And we kept bugging them and pushing them and saying, is there a point where we can kind of like batteries are so much more efficient now, you can get these little ones that do the same thing. And could we get an LED light bulb so that didn't require all these solar panels? And I, I think they would have done it eventually anyway, but we worked with them, we stayed with them. We, we were like, we've done some research, we're more than happy to help with this if you need, you know. And we eventually got, I don't have pictures of the updated, but a year or two ago, they replaced this huge battery rack with a system of like three or four small little, about the size of car batteries. They fit behind a bed, they don't off gas. And a, they took away two or three of the solar panels. They still have one, but that's okay. So this is what it looked like when we got it. These were, um, thank you again, Bruce, for reminding us that spark plugs were modular. They would bring these steel plates out on a big barge from Boston, and they would bolt them together on site. Start with the case on, put the granite riprap in there, and then brick it. Now, we have a bunch of theories about why we have brick interior, and that has to do with a local island called Widow's Island, which was a tuberculosis 
sanitarium post World War II, uh, sorry post Civil War. So there was a large hospital made of brick on a local island, and I mean an island that's you know maybe an, an acre in diameter, and they put all of the people infected with tuberculosis out in there. And at some point after tuberculosis wasn't a big deal and the civil war was over, I believe that they dismantled the hospital. And I believe, I have no proof of this, but there's no brick left on that island, that the brick came to the lighthouse and they used it to line the interior of the lighthouse when they were making it. Because it's relatively rare that you have a spark plug lighthouse with a brick interior. So I think it all came from the former hospital on a local island. These little pie-shaped wedges are really hard to walk on. In fact, you trip on them a lot. When we got there initially, it was just a lot of beer bottles from the local kids, dead pigeons and seagulls, I'm afraid to say, and garbage from people just kind of climbing up. Yes, of course, the Coast Guard would lock it. The local kids as a rite of passage will come with their crowbars and pull that padlock right off. They didn't harm the lighthouse, but it was always considered part of North Haven. And they felt like it was always their right to occupy it, especially at midnights on weekends. And of course, the bigger concern is that they like to jump off of it, hopefully at high tide. Um, so this became a little bit of a concern. Our first order of business, in case you haven't figured it out, is carpentry. We need to put in floors because it's almost impossible to walk on it and to replace windows. In the 1960s, when they automated it, they took out all the original um, windows and they filled them with glass block. And guess what we have found? Even though glass block is certainly not historically accurate, it withstands all the hurricanes. And we are trying hard to save and get Anderson to donate us some hurricane standard glass, you know, because engineering and technology has improved tremendously over the last 15 years with regard to hurricane standard windows. Uh, they are not in the mood to do that right now because they're donating so much to Florida. <laughs> um, but we still have these glass block windows. We were thinking of replacing them with plexiglass. Unfortunately, we replaced four windows with plexi and the locals broke them. And I know you're saying that's almost impossible not if you're determined to get in a lighthouse. So we've left the glass block in for now because it's the most safe and secure thing and it really does protect the lighthouse. Rust is our biggest problem, as you can imagine. It's got some beautiful architectural detail. These, um, you know, th this is the top. Uh, you've got, this is, well, this is the iron staircase that goes down to the keep. You've got these great little, um, what are they called? Pinnacles or something that, that kind of drop off the bottom of the lighthouse. And you've got a nice little uh, antenna rod on top of the cupola on the beacon. But the floors were a big challenge because you're talking about something that's round. A lot of people just said, bring in one inch plywood and just shape it and place it and be happy and just, you know, do something on top of that like Pergo. And that's just not the way we do things. So the very first order of business was, and this is the only piece of floor that we had left. It's right in the ent entrance. And you can see that it, you know it's got years of, of crackling paint on it. That's actually a hatch that they could lift up to drop supplies down into the keep that were too big or heavy to take down the stairs. So there was a little um, uh, pulley above this hatch. We measured and studied the wood that was in the inner entrance. And that's all that was left. All the rest was taken out, we believe, when it was decommissioned to get rid of any um, fire hazard. So they took all the wood floors out because they don't want the kids breaking in and setting bonfires inside and, and setting the whole thing on fire and dying. So we did our best to emulate that. I'm going to get to the floors. First thing we had to do was get out there with a generator. Uh, you do understand the solar panels that you saw belong to the Coast Guard. We can't touch that system. That belongs to them. That is government property. That runs the lighthouse uh, light and the foghorn. And so we took, and, and now I look at these pictures and I can't believe we ever did this. We were out of our minds to put a 500 pound generator in an inflatable Achilles. But at the time, that's all me and my husband had. So we tested it, we checked it, we did our calculations and we made a promise to each other that if the boat started sinking, we would not try to save the generator and float it to the surface because that would have been something we would have tried to do. We took everything up with black and tackle or um, chain hoist. We had no electricity. So there was no electrical hoist as you can imagine. And he and I did all of this ourselves. We just um, were determined. I don't know, young and stupid, I guess. So we 
literally took it out of this little inflatable boat where it could have sunk at any point on the very slow putt-putt from the island, which took about half an hour. Um, we always dragged the kayak behind us. You'll see it in the background so that if the, the inflatable did sink, we'd have a way to get back to land. Um, and this was our original energy system so that we would have enough power to run the power tools the saws that we needed to put the floor in, okay? First order of business. So you make your punch list. I managed to find the most fabulous Southern yellow heart pine in Taunton, Massachusetts. It used to line cranberry uh, bog, uh, cranberry tanks in Taunton, Mass, if you can imagine. And it was three inches thick, tongue and groove. And it was wonderful because A, it was tongue and groove. B, it was antique. The guy had been tearing down cranberry tanks and decided to take it home because it was too beautiful a lumber to, to, to waste. It still has cranberry stucks in the little nooks and crannies. And we made two trips to Taunton and moving trucks and brought it all back and laid it all out. And then it's Casey's job to plane all of it. So uh, it all had to be planed. We did all of that on land and we did not have a proper boat. We brought our boat from our house in Connecticut, which was never meant to go on the ocean, but you just do what you have to do to succeed. And we, so we brought this poor um, cobalt that, that should never be in salt water, but we're just like, we don't care. We're just gonna wreck, the, wreck our lake boat and get this one out, out to the lighthouse. And we took it. You can imagine the locals had a very good laugh. They just laughed at us constantly, but we were just like, we're getting the wood out to the lighthouse. And then we uh, just started working. And we are not great with geometry, but we started cutting it. The, there's not one nail in these floors. That's really the end of the sentence. We sized them and curved the edges and cut the edges and shaped the edges so that we could hammer them with a mallet to where you see them just going in onto the little pie shaped, you know, skeleton of the floors. And we just hammered each piece in one at a time. And at the end, we put shims around the perimeter to draw it in and tighten it. And that's how we got our floors. And that was really the number one thing that we had to do. Yes, we have a lighthouse dog and she's no longer with us, but she loved being on the lighthouse. Um, getting the floors in and then getting them stained was really important because, uh, and by the way, we scraped all of the brick and we, you know, you have to wear your respirator masks. You have to collect everything. We didn't put one paint chip in the ocean. We took it all back and disposed of it properly. We like to say we're greener than the green giant. But you got to understand there's no oversight if you buy it yourself, which we did buy it. We, we didn't get this one by grant. And so you have to be committed to doing everything. And even though we didn't have our nonprofit in action at that point, we read the grant protocols and we made a personal commitment to do everything that we should do if we had gotten the lighthouse for free, kind of a karma-based thing. We decided we would do everything historically and just try to be as green as possible, preservation as possible, voluntarily, because it's just, just our ethos. So this was the color of the cast iron. It was all this lovely government issued kind of mud brown. And once we got the floors in, you see brown, brown, rusty brown, we were able to get a lovely donation of uh, high-end industrial paint. And we consulted with Benjamin Moore. They gave us the paint, they brought it out, we had Lowe's donating uh, $10,000 worth of materials from their local um, uh, Rockland store. And they helped us pick the colors. If you don't like the colors, you got to talk to Benjamin Moore. But according to their research, these would have been historical um, cast iron colors for the era. And then I used to be an antiques dealer. So furnishing it was, uh, I literally just went and started getting stuff from my warehouse and taking it there. Now we were living on the island at that time. My husband was the island doctor. And the contract came to a, a close very quickly. He decided he wanted to go back to Connecticut and actually make some money. So we found, we found that our three bedroom, two bath house on North Haven, which the town owned and gave us for free while he was the island doctor, suddenly we had to vacate that. All of the furniture came to the lighthouse. Uh, I don't even wanna tell you what a nightmare that was, hoisting um, all this stuff up into the lighthouse with a, a block and tackle, but we took mattresses and armoires and everything up in there. And this is what you kind of get a before and after. Once we put the floors in, you see how quick it comes together. Once you have your iron painted and you put your furniture in, 
Um, this was the before of the smallest room that we turned into a bunk room. It had peeling paint. It had a lot of equipment in there. That would, This is the fog detector that would run the fog signal. And once we repainted it with, again, just a butter cream color that uh, was advised by Benjamin Moore, put some bunk beds in there and it looks entirely different. We do have a red uh, tinted specter uh, in our in our beacon room. So even though we hang out there and play cards, to be honest, the red gives me a headache after a while. So we don't hang out there too much. We have done nothing to the beacon room except paint it. Um, the Coast Guard complains that our table is in the way when they come to change the light bulbs. And so they move it and then we just put it right back, okay? Um, our keep was the biggest challenge and I wish I had a better photo to show you, but that's what it looked like. And now um, my friend took it with a fisheye lens, which I don't love, but now it is actually a functioning kitchen and, um, we have a separate bathroom. I don't have a photo of that, but it uses a composting toilet, which we installed. And we even have an AGA cooker down there that works off of propane. Now, I know I'm a little bit out of town, so I'm gonna check in with time. I'm gonna check in with Jane real quick and see, can I get another 10 minutes? I mean, obviously if people have to bail, they can bail, but I'm gonna go quickly and tell you, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. I wanna just give a pitch. Jane, do I have a, yes? Yes, that's fine. This is okay. so fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, because I'm a professor, I can be a little long-winded. I love to tell <laughs> stories. So if people have to go off their lunch hour, you can go, but I'm going to keep talking. So my ethos, remember, once we had established our um, nonprofit for Beacon, our whole goal was to, uh, because I'm a professor and thanks to professor, and we really care deeply about um, the state of education and STEM education. And you got to know, I'm a criminologist and a lawyer. I am not a STEM person. Frank's a biologist. But I went out and I got a whole bunch of great faculty to teach science, technology, engineering, and math, because these are the crisis subjects in our schools. And we put together Greenlight Academy. You're actually looking at a page from our report to the 1772, because they were one of the first people. We got grants from Connecticut State uh, Department of Education uh, to run Greenlight Academy, but it doesn't cover materials. And 1772 was wonderful because they gave us 30,000 from the outset for our batteries and our solar panels and our wind turbines. So here you see us uh, in 2009, um, put in, sorry, it's grainy. I just took a snapshot from my grant report, putting up the first wind turbine with the kids. They designed it, they did the math, they figured out how the blades were gonna have to work and which way it would have to point. And then we went out there and erected it. Um, and we were in the process of putting in solar when things got political, as I've already discussed. And we ended up um, deciding to return Penfield to the GSA. Uh, and we asked 1772, we said, we put uh, $30,000 worth of material into Penfield. We're not done with our project, but we have another lighthouse in Maine. And we were, we're gonna move Greenlight Academy to Maine from Connecticut and work with College of the Atlantic in the future. And they have uh, a wonderful lighthouse station out in the Atlantic called Mount Desert Rock. And so we said, we explained what we were doing and we're like, is it okay if we take our materials from Penfield and recommission them to Goose Rocks Light? And they were like, preservation is preservation. Absolutely. Yes, of course. If you can salvage it from Penfield and use it on another lighthouse, you have our blessing. And I was just really touched because I, I explained everything to them. And they were like, they loved what we were doing with Greenlight Academy. They loved that we were having the kids involved on the lighthouse, helping design everything. These are kids. You have no idea what it's like cooking for 40 <laughs> on a lighthouse. That's them eating their crab chowder because it's the only thing Dr. Jordan can rustle up, you know, on a lighthouse. But the kids would come in groups. Uh, we would take them out there. They would inspect it. They would measure it. They would make their plans. Yes, they would eat crab chowder and they would help design. Can you see? I don't know. It's not that clear. Oh, sorry. Hang on. Um, it's a little bit hard, but I'll show you another photo later. Look on the roof of the catwalk and you will see the solar panels laying kind of like beads on a necklace going around that roof. Hopefully you can't see them because we designed it to be invisible. And the ones on the top catwalk that you do see belong to the Coast Guard. And we did not want to add one more solar array panel to the catwalk because we consider it an eyesore. And so when we put in our own solar panels and the kids helped design this, we faced them and designed them so that they could be bolted directly to the catwalk roof. So if you can see those little kind of black chiclets sitting on top of the catwalk roof, that's our solar system. And the kids helped design that. And this is part of what they did in their math class. You know, what's the pitch? Which way do they have to point? We did a lot of STEM skills. It's a residential program. They live in a college. Um, first, we did it at Western Connecticut State where I teach. 
<clears throat> and then we moved it to Maine. Uh, where College of the Atlantic took over as hosts. The kids live on the college campus. And you're, we're talking about kids who don't think they can go to college. By the end of this, they're all um, thinking they can go to college. We really do instill a lot of confidence. And I have to give it to Frank. He's the one who designs the curriculum and, and has just been the backbone of this. So when they design this, I want you to know how hands-on things are. Once they design on paper how the, the um, solar panels are going to be bolted, then we're like, okay, we get in touch with our ship and we go, we're going to put solar panels in. Here's the design. They're like, great. But before you do that, you need to prep your surface. <laughs> and we're like, okay. And they told us exactly what paint to get. They have to approve it. We sent them the receipt. Like, don't even start work before you show them that you've procured the proper kind of paint. And um, liability is no joke. We don't let students walk out on our catwalk roof. So guess who gets to do that? Casey Jordan in an old climbing harness with a rope tie, you know, around her. I'm the one who painted and prepped the roof because um, I won't ask anyone to do something I won't do myself. So it's not fun when the wind comes up, believe me, and you feel like you're about to get blown into the ocean. But we're smart. We tether ourselves in. We do. We literally just wear climbing harnesses and go over the side. And in the end, that's what we got. We paint, we primed it with the proper primer. Then we painted it with the Shippo approved paint. And then we put in these solar panels that don't show from, from land or unless you have an aerial view, you're not gonna be able to see them. So we were really proud of that and kids designed it. I have another bad fisheye picture, but you see we have a wind turbine that we put out there when we're there. And that also can charge the batteries on foggy or rainy days when we don't have solar. We have a decent um, battery system. It's the same one that 1772 funded us in 2009 and it's still going strong. We're still using it. So the first decade of Goose Rocks, we really pushed it as the so-called keeper's experience. And that is where we, and, and this is important, people say, oh, you rent the lighthouse. And we're very specific. We don't rent the lighthouse. We allow people to donate to our preservation project. And in exchange, it's a thank you. And they have to modify their tax write-off for this, we let them stay at the lighthouse or come for a day if they want as our thank you to them. And you can imagine this was incredibly popular. The problem over time was, uh, and you will go to our website and you'll see, make a donation. You know, we started at like 200 a night. And what the problem was that it's incredibly labor intensive to get people out there. It's not really a stay, it's an experience. You have to meet them at the ferry. You've got to take them to the store if they don't have food. You've got to haul your water. You've got to take all the garbage off. You've got to take linens and then take them back to the island and wash them and bring them back and make beds and sweep and vacuum and haul propane, which they go through amazingly. And uh, we have been in process with an RO system and we've decided it's not a good use of our solar energy. And so we've just are still hauling water. Uh, people love, love, love to come out there, but many of the people who were donating to have their experiences on the lighthouse, and I'm gonna be nice, were not appropriate for a lighthouse stay. They thought that was Airbnb, they were incredibly demanding, they treated us like help they would call us at midnight and say, we need a beer run, come get us. You know, it was, we learned the hard way that you really need to hand pick the people who would go on lighthouses. Some people could not climb the ladder. Some people do it in heels, as you are seeing. I put that there on purpose. The lady is climbing the lighthouse in her heels, even though we're very specific about what to wear and what not to wear. Um, we are very concerned about people falling in. We've had 88 year olds climb that ladder. We've had three year olds climb that ladder, but some people cannot climb the ladder. And you don't want people having panic attacks. That's been a problem we really underestimated. You don't want people freaking out in the middle of the night that they are on a lighthouse in the middle of the ocean and calling us and saying, come get me off this damn thing, which has happened. So we have kind of rearranged and changed everything. But I want to, if you will indulge me for about five minutes, show you the, um, this is probably your best six minutes to understand what we did with Goose Rocks Light. And this was our pitch for donor keeper stays. And then I'll tell you what the status is now since we have learned over the decade, uh, the ins and outs of um, having people donate to the preservation project, but then expect that they're gonna move in like an Airbnb. But here's, here's a little bit more about it. Casey, is there audio with this? You don't hear it? No. Oh, let me, I think there's something I have to click that says share. Who knows how I can share my audio? 
it's a pres it's a presenter thing. Show presenter view. Let's see. I'm gonna try to get nope. Ah. Hang on. Um, I run into this when I'm teaching, and there is something specific I have to set so that you hear my audio. I'm gonna try it again and let's see if it works. You tell me if there's audio, okay? Because I have audio. <laughs> Do you have it? No. No. Okay. Hang on one second. It's, hang on, I'm gonna bring in some help real quick. Chat participants. Hey, Lene. It's somewhere here. Last viewed, high presenter view screen, subtitle, keep slider, help. There is a particular button I have to push to share the audio with you. I'll tell you what, I'm gonna move on. And if I have time, how about this? Anybody who wants to see the video, which is really good, um, you can go to our Beacon website and just say, stay at Goose Rocks, and it will play the video for you. It's five minutes, and it really kind of shows in five minutes the progression of our whole restoration process. But since we're not going to have that, let me just move along. Eh, 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 it doesn't want to. <laughs> Hold on. Let me tell you what we're doing now. Um, we take people who've stayed on the lighthouse who are donors, we call them the known donors, and we still do the stays. I have to tell you that Goose Rocks has been a real labor of love. We have lighthouse open houses several times a summer. We haul people in our little orange boat from, Go we won't go all the way. They have to take the ferry to the island and they will pick them up at the ferry port on North Haven and we'll bring them out. And I cook for them and, you know, cookies and tours and everything. Our, Ethos is also that if ever people come and they do all the time on boats or kayaks by the lighthouse and go, ahoy, matey, permission to come aboard? We're like, yes, you can. We just let anyone, unless they look dangerous, who wants to come aboard the lighthouse in, they, they love it. I can't even tell you. Kids come out, then the word gets out and people are coming out with their children. They feel like they're in Swiss Family Robinson. They're climbing all over the lighthouse. So we don't really even have to have a open house days. We do that in you know, in cooperation with um, Maine's Lighthouse Preservation Society, they have host specific lighthouse days, but we have more people who just come by all summer long and just say, can I come up and take a look at the lighthouse? And we always say yes, and we help them up and, and feed them and let them hang out. And that has turned out to be the better way to do our kind of cultural sharing of this particular lighthouse. So that kind of takes us up to where we are with Swell. Um, you know, we've got our wonderful lighthouse in Maine. We returned Penfield. Uh, we've decided that uh, with the grants drying up, I'm gonna tell you straight up, that is the biggest problem, uh, obstacle that we now face. We weren't even sure that we wanted Southwest Ledge Light. GSA called us and said, you, will you please, they know us obviously. We've done a bunch of um, applications and they consider us a real success story of people who privately bought a lighthouse and done the right thing with it. So whenever people call the GSA, like the Today Show, we were on the Today Show, the Today Show is like, do you have anybody who'll be in Today Show talking about what you're doing with lighthouses? They always send them to us. And so we've, you know, we've had a lot of great press in Soundings Magazine. I was in Oprah Magazine, you know, what it's like to live in a lighthouse, um, Yankee Magazine, Coastal Living Magazine. You can see all these articles on our website. But GSA called and said, hey, Casey, we've got a lighthouse near you, and it's very similar to your spark plug, and you know everything about these cast iron lighthouses. Would you consider bidding on it? And I went and I looked at it um, when it was in the grant proposal process, and there was just me and one other nonprofit that were considering writing the grant for it. And long story short, um, I was I just had a lot going on in my life at that time. Uh, I didn't have my husband with me anymore. And I knew it was really just too much for me to do. So I said, no, I won't be writing a grant for it. Then um, they put it up a year later uh, for inspection for people who were interested in bidding on it. And we got a call from some people who uh, representing basically Southern Connecticut State University who were like, hey, we're Southern. You, Dr. Jordan, teach at Western we would like to make a partnership with you because Southern, which is of course in New Haven, would really like to procure this lighthouse and use it for a science center location. So we had many, many meetings and I'm gonna put this on speed. We went back out, looked at it and agreed to partner with Southern who had some benefactors. Um, and I was very upfront. I said, we, 
when I say we don't have the money for this, we don't have the money. Frank and I each donated $5,000 of our own money, but we were like, because that's the best we could do. We were like, we just have so weird. We are the kind of people who are burning the candle at both ends. We don't want to bite off more than you can chew. And you don't just get a lighthouse for free to get a lighthouse for free. If you don't have the means to actually do what you need to do with it, then you shouldn't do it. But Southern convinced us that we should partner with them. And, and we did. Long story short, we were able, do you see, we didn't get it for free. I wish they had told me this a year before. I would have written the grant for them. They could have paid me to do it and Southern would have had it for free. Instead, we had to do a bidding process and you can be sure, guess who had to be up at three in the morning bidding at the last moment, trying to make sure that we ended up getting it. Checking with Southern, checking with the liaison, with the benefactor, raising money, raising money. And every time we had to raise it another $10,000, we had to go out there and say, does anybody out there have another $10,000 so I can bid safely? And that was tough. It was very much like the little match girl, please can, you know, will you, will you please give us a little money? Uh, in the end, we got it. And I am no regrets. But can I just, you know, when I talk about the challenges for Swell in the future, logistics, as Frank talked about, boat transport for materials. Frank is a wonderful emissary. You know, he's getting the New Haven Yacht Club. We've had um, a lot of people talk about donating boat space. You've got to get it all donated if you're going to get it done. I mean, we just don't have any pockets anymore. <laughs> Volunteers want to get out there. We are very concerned about liability. Here's where it came down to. We got the money for the lighthouse, but we didn't get any money for the actual preservation. Okay. And remember, we're private buyers. So we, we're not on a five year clock. We can take our time. And so we're going out now for the money. The problem is that uh, what I call the, the politics, the too many cook syndrome. And I'm just being transparent. When you have a partnership, even good partnerships can slow the process. So Beacon is a 501c3 nonprofit where my board of directors are a group of people devoted to preservation who donate our own money to make things happen all the time. Uh, we go after grants when we can get them. Um, and we are very dedicated to the idea that Southern students and local New Haven high school students, we would like to reignite Greenlight Academy again because grant money ran out five years ago and we would love to, to get it going again but we need the money. The, the challenge is that um, the benefactor who would donate the money wants complete control. And it has been sticky because I, it's not that I want complete control. I'm dedicated to preservation and the benefactor is not. And I am not going to just relinquish all control of a lighthouse, which Beacon owns um, with partnership with Southern, but it's, it's, we deeded it. We did all the negotiations. We got the insurance. I, you know, I feel like I spent half my life looking at legal documents and, and negotiating the bottomlands lease with the, with Connecticut. Remember, I'm the one who doesn't believe it belongs to Connecticut. I believe it still belongs to the feds. So there was just a lot that had to happen. We, it took from the time we won it to the time they actually closed on it was two or three years, but we were the first ones to be grant, to be sold a lighthouse under the new covenants with, um, Connecticut's Department of Environmental Protection, who is overseeing the lease process for the bottom lands. So it's complicated. I don't want you to think it's easy at all. Grants have virtually dried up. And this is where I want to give a huge shout out to uh, Preservation Connecticut for giving us $9,000 to assist with our painting of this lighthouse. Uh, so far, it's been tough because we got that notice last year. I had a benefactor, I had a donor for our paint, $30,000 worth of paint. They wrote the letter in February. We wrote our grant prop for uh, Connecticut, for Connecticut, for Preservation Connecticut, we got the grant, you know, we'll match it with this and we'll match it with that. And a month later, COVID hit. And all of a sudden our um, donor for the paint were very nice, but they were like, our business has dropped off 90%. We just don't, we can't give away $30,000 worth of paint right now. And I was like, okay, I'll check in with you in a year. And I just checked in with them again. And they're like, we're still not doing so well. We've had to create micro microbial paints for the COVID era and we're away, you know, it's just like they're an industrial paint manufacturer. So I needed to know that the 2020 COVID, everything came to a standstill. We were going to spend all last summer out there painting it and all of a sudden everything, as you know, ceased. Now that I've been trying to get that going again and find a new benefactor for our paint and reaching out to, to, to um, Benjamin Moore again, and they're lovely, but they're like, we already gave you $30,000 of the thing. So now I've got to go look at Sherwin Williams or somebody else. And that is coupled with, as you all know, a 2021 labor shortage, contractors prices are off the scales. So my initial estimate from the contractor who was going to do the painting, um, he's basically like, not only has it tripled, but I just don't think I could do it in the next two to three years. Sorry, Casey, the housing boom is huge. We can't be giving away free labor right now or discounted labor. So 
We need to first address better dockage. First, there was only one rung missing from the ladder. It didn't slow me down at all, but now there's three rungs missing from the ladder. So first thing we have to do is get a nuclear welder out there and get a whole new ladder in there. And, you know, we've got these things, we continue to work on them, but they can be tiresome to constantly have these conversations with your partners um, when you feel like you're doing all the work and they're just telling you what their plan is, but you don't get all the help. So. Uh, grants having dried up has been a real slowdown as well. Um, given that I'm so over time, I want to address the questions from attendees, and I'm more than happy to arrange talks with you later if it gets to be too detailed. Somebody asked about taxes. I think the owner of Saybrook, you should know we put in a grant for Saybrook Breakwater Light, but we did not get it. And that one was mired in politics and it was making us happy we didn't get it. Um, based on our research, a beautiful lighthouse needed a lot of repair with the uh, lower case on it had a huge crack in it and it would take so much money to fix it and keep it from leaking. Um, and I'm glad that a wonderful steward has it now. But when we were out there, I went out there with a, a reporter from, um, I guess the Hartford Current when we were inspecting it and somebody literally hit a golf ball into the window of her car and shattered her window. And it was a message. I'm not imagining it. <laughs> We're not imagining it. It was like, go away. This is our lighthouse. Go. We don't want anyone else to have it or to be on it. And we had been through so much with Penfield that we just decided Saybrook was not a good choice for us. Um, like I said, we've, we're, we've got a great relationship with New Haven. We don't pay taxes because we are a nonprofit. And we're doing historical preservation. And uh, as far as I know, all municipalities have the ability to waive property taxes for things like churches and museums and things that are involved in nonprofit historical preservation. And New Haven, who, who New Haven has always been part of our Greenlight Academy. So they, of course, know us and like us. And um, don't they don't monkey with us. They know we're doing good things. And Southern is there. So we don't pay taxes there. I voluntarily pay taxes on North Haven. They're about $500 a year. They have asked if I am requesting to waive those 500. And it obviously makes a lot more sense for me politically to pay the 500 than to ask for a waiver. And it buys me a lot of goodwill on the island to just voluntarily pay the, the token amount of like, I don't know, five or 600 a year that we pay on Goose Rocks. Um, there we don't have property issues per se because we own the ledge. We don't have any um, bottomlands issues because our deed includes the ledge as much as you can see at low tide that's how it's described, belongs to us. <laughs> At low tide, whatever ledge you can see is our property. So we're embedded in our own property there and we don't have to worry about bottoms lands leases out there, but it was a real hassle getting the one for swell. So I'm with regard to taxes, the answer is it depends. It depends on where you are and mostly it depends on your municipality and whether they like you and wanna make your life miserable. And so the first thing you wanna do if you don't wanna get into big nightmares with property taxes and the other thing was building permits um, is make friends with City Hall. And sometimes that's possible and sometimes it's not. So that should have a big um, impact on whether or not you wanna buy a lighthouse. You should do your research beforehand. Somebody asked how many lighthouses are decommissioned in private and I had no idea. So I looked it up just before and I'll show you a slide um, in one second and answer that question. And somebody asked about environmental challenges and I don't mean to be coy, but for environment with a lighthouse, I don't care whether you're offshore in the middle of the water or right on the edge of the water. For us, it is salt water, salt water, salt water, salt air, salt breeze, salt, 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 salt in your teeth. It just destroys everything. And you will be chasing rust for the rest of your life. We are busy working with uh, people for many years about the best way to paint the lower case on of um, goose rocks. And believe it or not, they're recommending that we leave the barnacle coated case on the way it is. Don't strip the barnacles because they say the barnacles are protecting the lighthouse better than any paint can. It took a long time to get that answer. And so we, we have to be very careful with the rust removal and, um, people have said, well, you've owned it for over 10 years, well, almost 15 years. Why haven't you painted it yet? And honestly, it's because we're in touch with the leading manufacturers of the paint and the technology is changing so fast with regard to the products that are out there that are environmentally safe and friendly and historically friendly. Um, the, we're glad we didn't paint it 10 years ago because now we have a lead with our friends at Tamco Paint about paint that you can just put on over the rest and it will actually encapsulate it and keep it from demising further that stripping it is gonna be the worst thing you can do for it. So we're just waiting until we get all the right advice and the right um, 
the right products to do it right. So to answer the last question, this is a little bit out of date. This is from the 2017 NHLPA report. So it's four years out of date, but as of that date, oh, hang on. Uh, uh, uh. In 2017, the NHLPA had transferred a total of 140 lighthouses and of those 61 had been sold to private people. Okay, so I'd say about one third have been sold. And I think that number is going up, to be honest. The government, when I love this, wants people to take them for free and preserve them and be on the watchdog list. But that costs the government a lot of money because then National Parks has to be the overseer and they have to review all the reports and they have to visit and everything else. So it's tempting for them because they have raised over 8 million uh, since 2000. In 20 years, they've raised $8 million in lighthouse sales, and I'm sure it's a lot more than that now, it's that we're three or four years after the statistic, could be closer to $10 million now. Um, the prices have gone up tremendously, as you know. Uh, the most expensive lighthouse, I think, sold for $933,888. It was the 100th lighthouse transferred under the NHLPA. So people are now going to be willing to pay a million dollars for lighthouses. That's great if they're willing to fix them, if they will match that and keep them preserved. So my concerns as somebody who's both been granted a lighthouse and bought a lighthouse um, I am. I want a hybrid. I have no problem with people buying lighthouses. I just want to make sure they're dedicated to preservation and they have to do that voluntarily. So I want to be an emissary for how to buy a lighthouse, but still voluntarily adhere to the preservation um, guidelines that are recommended. And if you want to get one for free, that's great, but you're going to need a big board of experts you're going to need deep, deep pockets. You are going to need it. It's almost a full-time job to keep up with your five-year plan. And having owned one and gotten one for free that was mired in political problems, I, for me, the answer is to buy it, if you can afford it, and voluntarily preserve it for the greater good. That way you can be on your own schedule and I've heard a lot of, a lot of the ones that have been given away for free have actually been reverted back to the feds because they have not stayed on their five-year plan. And that just slows things down for the, the people who are willing to buy them and preserve them. So that that is my much over, over schedule, long-winded presentation on Goose Rocks. Um, if you have any questions, obviously you're gonna visit beaconpreservation.org and you can contact us. Um, certainly Jane knows how to reach me. But Frank and I are easily Googleable. We both teach at Western Connecticut State, and um, we will happily help anybody who wants to preserve a lighthouse. Hey, well, see, thank this, you. This, this is Bruce Buckley. I'd like to talk to you about paint. Okay. Well, how, how can we how can we make that happen? How's about um, can well, I give you the email address? Can you? How about this? Can you remember Dr. Casey Jordan at gmail.com? D R C A S E Y J O R D A N. And that is the fastest way to reach me. Yes, Beacon has an email, but I've got assistants who are checking that. So I don't want to slow things down. If you just Google Dr. Casey Jordan, you're going to find me because. Uh, it has nothing to do with lighthouses. You're going to find that I I'm a criminologist and I have a personal website and it will take you right to me. Okay. Yep, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions? Poor Jane. I'm not letting her moderate. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions from anybody? Well, Casey, I'll give you some trivia. Originally when uh, New London or when New London Ledge Lighthouse was commissioned, it was commissioned as Ledge Lighthouse. Yes. And they found there was a lot of confusion between our light and the, your light in New Haven. Consequently, uh, we went to New London Ledge Lighthouse. Yes, and we got Southwest Ledge Light, and we just find that calling it SWELL is SWELL, and <laughs> it's just a nice acronym that kind of worked out well for us. Well, I'm sure you've talked to Jeremy Dontremont, who is just the, the lighthouse guru of all lighthouse gurus. Um, up in uh, New Hampshire. He has been a wealth of information for us. He, he writes all the lighthouse books. He is just the, the most gen, genuine and generous, nice lighthouse historian on the planet. We have gotten so much help from him. Well, I, I will extend a, an open invitation to any time you want to come out to, to, to Ledge Lighthouse. Um, please do. Um, be careful what you wish for. No, I'm, I'm, I'll be there. <laughs> 
my email is easy, bruce.buckley at yahoo.com. So that I got. You got that early before everybody else was competing for that. All right, Bruce. Yes. Any other and questions? I've, and I've been out there. Ledge Light is a great lighthouse. <laughs> oh, you have? Good for you. Yep. Uh, well, what? they also received funds from the 1772 Foundation. Yep. There's a, a theme here with one of our major funders. <laughs> yeah, think, they've been I, wonderful. I they've been wonderful. We replaced all the windows with hurricane windows. Oh, I want to talk to you about that too. Yeah, it's a process. Yeah, we've got a, we had a manufacturer in, in South Windsor, Connecticut that made them for us. Oh, we're going to be chatting with you. Yes. You're going to hook us up. They, they, they built them and they actually came out and installed them for us as part of the price. Well, we'll offer them a free lighthouse stay in Maine if they want to come install them there. But we have we have literally brick brick casings. So you know what I mean? It's really the installation requires a lot of um, a lot of carpentry to go into the brick to hold okay. them tight. Yeah. That's the problem with a cast iron lighthouse. It's just it's hard to nail into. I'm a great believer in networking. So that's one of the Oh, reasons. so am I. <laughs> All right, Bruce, I'm, you're going to hear from me. Watch out. <laughs> Stacey, please tell me you are writing a book because these stories are amazing and I need to know all the stories about lighthouse preservation. Oh, Jamie, if there were more hours in a day. Um, <laughs> I got stories for days. Um, you know, I didn't go off on this too much. Our biggest problem in the decade we did lighthouse keepers was finding, uh, was finding caretakers. Mm. Um, I am a, I mean, I, I can't even tell you, there are just not enough hours in a day to get everything done. So of course you need an on-site caretaker because you can't be there. When my husband and I were doing it, you need two people for sure. You need somebody to go get the people, somebody to do the housekeeping. I mean, and I'm not bragging, but that's how humble we are. Do you understand? We just, we, it, between him and I, we had like three doctorates and four masters and we don't care. We are scrubbing the floors and cleaning the grill and making the beds ourselves. There's no way you can find hired help to help you with this stuff. You either do it because you love it or you don't do it. And we never, ever regretted any of that. But I mean, the bottom line is we would, I have, I've gone through a bunch of lighthouse keepers and a, most keepers meaning caretakers and probably seven out of 10 of those have been catastrophic, really bad. Yeah. Um, there is no one who will do this like you will do it, the owner. You know, the, the, the steward, if you are in a nonprofit, we don't even think of ourselves as owners. We think of ourselves as stewards. Mm -hmm. We've had so many disappointing situations where people thought of it as a party venue, you know, and just were, um, we have serious liability concerns. That's the lawyer in me, you know, um, friends and family, I don't worry about at all. If they fall off the lighthouse, they're not going to sue me, but people who come out and just want to jump in at low tide and break their necks and, you know, we've had, we've just had some people who were unsuitable and we had a lighthouse keeper, a caretaker who was highly unsuitable and basically thought it was his lighthouse and didn't want to get off it and commandeered my boat and tried to steal it. And it was, you know, we've had sticky situations. So all I can do, you know, you, we figured out early, you have to keep it, go really big or keep it really small. And at the beginning, we were trying to go big with our nonprofit and we realized very quickly you will lose sight of the beauty of your lighthouses. And I wasn't kidding when I said my board of directors did an intervention with me on Penfield because I had filed a federal lawsuit and they were like, okay, way to piss off the local town. Um, you know, and they were just like, Casey, you, we have this lighthouse in Maine and it needs our love and attention. Let's go there and just move green light from Penfield to Goose Rocks. It still needs help. The kids will just, will just move the kids up to Maine. And this is a little weird because we took Connecticut State Department of Education money and they knew what we were doing. It was in our proposal and spent it all in Maine. And it was sad that we had to do that. Do you understand? The money should have stayed within Connecticut and we should have been able to continue hosting it at a state university, continue to put the kids to work at Penfield. And it just is infuriating that politics gets in the way sometimes, that people aren't all about the greater good. So I got stories. But the bottom line is we never lose sight that it's the lighthouse we're doing this for, not for any other thing. And we pretty much just do friends and family. And if you are a lighthouse aficionado, you're in the category of friends and family, okay? So for people who still wanna to come to Goose Rocks, um, we still have it up on the website. We're like, oh, stays have been suspended. But when people reach out and say, you know, I've been involved in preservation. I love lighthouses. Um, we make it happen. Yeah. 
And that means Casey's going to bring you out in the boat and Casey's going to, going to, you know, haul your propane in your water and take your suitcases up and change your sheets and everything else. We want you to enjoy it. And the donations we get don't cover it. It doesn't even cover it. It just, we need a token of something because, you know, um, most of the money that goes into this preservation is going to be out of your own pocket. It's beautiful. I watched the whole video. I loved it. It's so beautiful. Oh, somebody saw the video. Good. I'm so glad. Yeah, I'm sorry I couldn't make the audio play. I'm just this so Zoom is beyond me. Give me give me a good chop saw any day of the week. But if you give me Zoom, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. I've been doing Zooms for two years and sometimes it still doesn't help. <laughs> thanks. I don't even know who's talking right now, but I love thanks for the compliment. Well, Jamie, um, I love that you bring the luggage up because I'm thinking, okay, I can make it up the ladder, but probably not holding two seats. <laughs> oh yeah, no. Um, we have, we tie pe we tie ropes around people who are worried, but we've never had anyone fall in. I'm the only person who's fallen off the lighthouse, and um, it's not fun. <laughs> I, I, so I'll probably request the rope, you know, just in yep. Case. We just tie the rope around you, just in case. It just gives you a sense of security. And I meet you on the landing and help you hand over. And once you're once you're on the landing, it's a piece of cake. And we haul dogs up, you know. It's um, my cats would not like to be hauled up sorry no but i have a cat a lighthouse cat and he loves it out there it's yeah. just you know the process of getting the litter box out there but and when we had a dog there uh i would have to kayak the dog over to the land sometimes at four in the morning you know when the dog needed to go the dog needed to go oh my and goodness. we would figure out a way and then i will promise i'll shut up i had a wonderful lighthouse dog molly you saw her in the photos we had an old dewalt tool bag and this dog would learn how to uh, on a rope the dog would wake you up and knew it was low tide and at low tide, you have some ledge underneath the lighthouse. Mm -hmm. And so the dog would come four in the morning and go, it's low tide, let me out. And we would go out groggy and the dog would jump into the tool bag. We could lower the tool bag onto the ledge. The dog would jump out of the tool bag, do her business, get back into the tool bag and I could haul her back up with the rope, okay? Wow. And if it was high tide, then I got to put her in the kayak where she would sit until I got down to the kayak. I'd lower her into the kayak with a rope and we would kayak over to the island where she could poop and come back. A little bit of extra effort there, but worth it if you love your dog. Oh my God. Is there like a people sized one that you could lower and lift me up in? Because I think <laughs> you know we have had one um, person who was wheelchair bound that we did haul up, and it was a bucket list thing. And I'm going to tear up because they weren't long for the earth, but we we got them on there. It was really. See, I think you are allowed to brag because I think the stories are amazing, and I think you're amazing. And let's just keep the bragging going. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Some days I'm just like, ah, <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? But I'm telling you, and I've been all over the world. I'm an avid, I'm, I don't ever call myself a tourist or even a traveler. I'm an explorer. I've been to more than 50 countries and I'm a, the world's oldest backpacker. And I have this kind of thing that you can't go home again. Once you've experienced something, you should just find the next place to go to and don't keep returning. And I, that's kind of my philosophy because it's a big world and you need to see so much of it. The one exception to this is my lighthouse, Goose Rock Light. Every spring when I go out there for the first time, it is as magical as the day in June 2006 when I first went up there on the lighthouse inspection. I am just full of wonder every time. This is, you know, this is the view. And um, I'm very just blessed. It's not the prettiest lighthouse on the planet or the biggest, but it is surrounded by incredible nature and really great people. And we've made great neighbors and they help us out when the boat's not working, they'll come pick me up and run me for groceries. And, you know, it's, it's a dream come true. I, of all the things I've done in my life and, and I tend to do too much, I never have regretted becoming a lighthouse keeper. Goose Rock, Penfield, and hopefully it's swell next. <laughs> well, Casey, thank you so much. This was really above and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> above and beyond. <laughs> Well, when we get Southwest Ledge Light going, which we just need to work out some some issues <clears throat> with, we need a memor memorandum of understanding with Southern, and then we're going to move forward about who controls things. Um, then we will definitely be having lighthouse days out there, and it's local, so we'll get all of you out there once our uh, Swell Lighthouse is renovated. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you very much. I'm happy to stick around if anybody has more questions, but if for the rest of you need to click out, I understand. Get back to your workday. Great. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Bye-bye.